Let's have a word of prayer as we, as we start today's teaching. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we appreciate you again for the desire to want to study your word. Job said, I have treasured your word more than my necessary food. And we thank you, Lord, for grace for us also to treasure even your word. Lord, the Bible says that deep call it unto deep as a sprout of the, of the waterfalls. It is only the spirit of God that can minister to the spirit of man. And therefore, Lord, we yield our spirit's man even unto you. And ask, Lord, that your spirit will minister to our spirit man. Lord, deposit in us, O oh God, life. Deposit in us, O oh Lord, grace and mercy. And everything that we need even to live godly lives, even on this earth, in fulfillment of your divine counsel for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yes, so this is our third, uh, our third edition on the making of the sweet psalmist of Israel. You know, David went through a very rigorous process to be made one of the best of worshippers that the world has ever produced. It took many years, but it took the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. And all that we've been doing in the last two months is to try to lay the foundation. In part one, we saw how the children of Israel rejected the one true God and demanded for a king so that they would look like every other nation. And we established from that series that there is a tendency, you know, for man always to want to be like what he sees, rather than following a God that he doesn't see. And so the children of Israel rejected God. And of course, God had prophesied that, you know, in the days of Moses, through Moses himself, that the time is going to come that these children are going to reject me and they will demand, you know, for a king. And so God commanded Samuel at the time, at the time at which they demanded for that king, God commanded Samuel to appoint, to anoint someone. And of course, Saul was anointed. We saw how the, the spirit of God came upon Saul. And then we saw the different tests, you know, that Saul had to go through. And two major ones, he failed those tests. And at that point, God had to reject him and to go in for someone else. That was part one. And then in part two, we saw how how Samuel, despite the fact that God had rejected Saul, he didn't give up on Saul. He kept mourning for the sake of Saul and perhaps pleading that God would have mercy even upon Saul and reconsider him again. But at a point, God came to him and said, look, you have mourned enough. It is time for you to take the horn of oil and go to Bethlehem and anoint for me somebody there that I will tell you of. God did immediately tell him who, who the person is to be until Samuel got there and the sons of the sons of Jesse they came they came before him, the first seven, and God rejected the seven of them. And God told Samuel that there's still one more. And when David came, David was anointed king. That's what we saw in part two. And the moment David was anointed, anointed king, there was a transference of spirit, an exchange. The spirit of God that was upon Saul came upon David. And then something else, you know, took over the life of Saul. Something else took over the life of Saul because in, in the spiritual realm, there is no vacuum. Even Jesus himself, you know, made reference to this in the book of Matthew when he said, when you cast out a spirit out of a man, the spirit goes over the, over, over, over the dry places looking for somewhere to stay. And when he finds none, he returns back to that, to that person with seven more powerful persons, you know, seven more powerful spirits to reside in that person. And so there is no vacuum in the spiritual realm. Once God gets out, another spirit, of course, the spirit of the devil takes over. And I think that is where we, you know, we stopped. Now, today's highlight or highlight of today's study, uh, our main text is 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 14, you know, to 23. That's about, about nine verses. We're not going to go by verse by verse, but we're going to pick our short teaching from some of the points, you know, that we shall see in this uh, text. We shall see that David was anointed king without recommendation. David wasn't recommended by anyone when he was anointed. God did it all himself. As, as I shared, you know, uh, a, a short moment ago, it was God that commanded Samuel. He said, take your horn of oil and go to the house, to, to the house, you know, to, to the home of Jesse. Even Samuel didn't know who the king to be anointed to be. He didn't know. And so it was not a case of David being recommended. He wasn't recommended by anyone. When God is going to put his anointing upon individuals, he does not need anybody to recommend who that person is to be because God knows the aim and out of us. The Bible says, if I hear himself say, he said, you look on the outside of men, but I look at the inside. I begin my work from the inside. And so even Samuel himself didn't know 
And so it was not, David's anointing was not a case of someone recommending him. He wasn't recommended to the anointed king. On the other hand, for him to stand before King Saul, he has to be recommended. The anointing is not just going to bring him before King Saul. There's going to be the need for someone to recommend him to come into the presence of King Saul. And if there is anyone we can talk about as being great in those days, we talk about kings because there were kingdoms in those days. Today, we would say, we would say probably president of a country, depending on the country, or a prime minister. To come into the presence of these powerful people, these most influential people in societies, even of today, there is a need for someone to recommend you. And this recommendation is not based on ethnicity, neither is it based on race. No, it is based on practical qualification. That is, what do you have to deliver? What do you have to contribute? What impact do you have to make? That is why the Bible says that the gift of a man shall make room for him and shall bring him before great men. There must be something that you have that you have to, to something that you have to showcase, something that you have to present to the people that will make it worthwhile for you to be brought even such great people in the world. And so the third point here is that the recommendation of David, as we shall see in this study, was not based on the on, on just who he is. It was based on what he could contribute, what what solution he had for the problem that was at hand. So this is a highlight of today's study. Just three key points we're going to be looking at, you know, broken into different uh, sections. Praise God. Now, the world that we live in, I, I call it a needs-driven world. That this is a world that has problems and needs solution. And this is not recent. Historically, it has been so. I want to believe this began, at least from what, from what we know from scripture, it began with the time that Adam sinned. The moment Adam sinned, the world became driven by needs. And so there are problems and the problems will continue until Christ comes. In fact, one would be naive to think that he can solve the problems of the world. You don't have a solution to the problems of the world. But there is a particular problem that you can address that God can use it to solve. And so the world is need-driven. There are several problems. There are several challenges in the world. And because the world is need-driven, men will only accept you. They will receive you when they see you as a solution. The moment they see you as a threat, they will get rid of you. They will reject you. That is what happens in the world. Even in the church, the church is not an exception. It's not an exception. Your place of work is not an exception. Your academic institution is not an exception. The moment men see you to be a solution to their problem, they will receive you. And you see that very well in scripture. But the moment they consider, they perceive that you are a threat to something concerning them, or even a threat to their lives, to their kingdom, to anything, they will reject you. And so you see, for instance, Joseph's brothers, they rejected him when they saw him as a threat. They saw that the love of the father was shared probably about 80% of it, at least more than 50% of it was on Joseph. Whereas the other 11 were sharing less than 11% of the love of the father. And so, and so they saw Joseph as a threat and seeing him as a threat, what they did was to reject him. What they did was to cast aspersions at him. What they did was to attempt to get rid of him. When the world sees you not as a solution, but as a threat, the world wants to get rid of you. But the moment that they had a problem, which was that of famine, they began to embrace Joseph. They had to leave even their own land and go to the land of Egypt to go to seek, you know, for bread. And when they met Joseph there, they were even much more willing even to receive him. Again, the world, this world, this world is a world that is needs driven and we accept you when you are seen as a solution to their problem. But the moment they perceive you as a threat, they will want to get rid of you. Another example that we have in scripture is Jephthah. Jephthah was born, you know, into a home. And in this home, of course, he was a son of was a son of a prostitute, but at least they had just one father. When it was time, you know, to share the inheritance, they got rid of him. They said, You are not going to be a part, you are not going to partake of this inheritance. They got rid of him. They saw him as somebody who was going to share in what belonged to them. And they didn't want that to happen. So they got rid of him. They chased him, you know, out of their home, out of even the kingdom. 
And what did Jephthah do? Jephthah didn't give up. Jephthah went to train himself. And the moment he became a mighty warrior, they had to send elders, you know, to go invite him, to go plead with him. That even Jephthah began to dictate the terms of engagement. They invited him to become their leaders. Why did they reject him? Because they saw him as a threat. Why did they go to invite him? Because they had a problem and they now saw him as a solution to the problem. You've got to be a solution to a problem, at least a problem in the world, before you can be received, before you can make impact. Because God didn't save you and is not keeping you in this world that you will not be a solution to something. No, God has not saved you to be a solution to your own problem. He has saved you to be a solution to problems, to challenges that are in the world. And for you to be able to, 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 to play that role, you got to prepare yourself. you got, you got to equip yourself with certain tools that you need to be able to address challenges. Even Jesus himself, Jesus came as solution to humanity's need of salvation and the consequences of sin. Adam had fallen and there is the need to save this man. Jesus came to save this man. He also came, you know, to address the consequences of sin, which includes sicknesses, diseases, poverty, and so on. And so we see all of creation revolving around being solution to challenges that are in this world. Praise God. You see, sometimes, sometimes, and I want to believe that this corroborates the scripture, which says, what is man that thou art mindful of man? Why is God so concerned about man? Why is God so concerned about me? Why is everything in the universe revolving around man? It's, this, is, this is a question that we cannot fathom. The love of God for humanity, the love of God for this thing that is known as man, why is God so interested in him? Yes, it's God that created him. God created other beings also. But why is God so much interested in man? It is because man in the first place is created in the image of God. It's taken from God himself, unlike the angels and others who were spoken into existence. So we live in a world that is driven by needs. And for you to be accepted in this world, and I believe also to stay and to fulfill your destiny, you got to be a man of solution to certain problems in the world. Praise God. Now, we're going to be talking about the sweet, the sweet psalmist of Israel, who is David himself. We see we see David be and in the midst of his brethren, you know, being anointed by Samuel itself. The anointing of God came upon him. The oil was poured even upon David. And for that moment, it became someone that was anointed. But this anointing, as we have seen in previous teachings, didn't take him to the throne. It is not every time that God's anointing upon you. If at the most cases, God's anointing on your life will not take you to the throne. Rather, you go face the devil. The moment the spirit of God comes upon you, the devil is going to be after you. The moment Jesus was anointed, Jesus was baptized, you know, of, 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 of water. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, 17, the next thing that happened to him was that he was led into, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So the anointing that came upon David at, at, at this particular instance didn't lead him to the throne. In fact, it took at least another 10 years before David got to the truth. Now, God can create problems for which he alone has the solution. I remember many years ago, some of us belong to that church where someone, someone, a minister of the gospel shared with us, he said they had a meeting and I think it was, uh, it was this crossover meeting and he said that, that, he said before he went for that meeting, he had prayed to God, he had told God, I wanted to create a problem that only you has a solution for. And the person said he prayed that prayer and he went for the meeting. And as the meeting was progressing into the early hours of the first day of the year, he said somebody dropped dead in the church and people began to people began to retreat from the church saying, this is a bad sign. How can we begin a new year with somebody dying here? And they began to retreat. And the general overseer of that church called this person that came in and said, look, what are we going to do? Well, he said, let's talk to God and let's hear what he says. And God says, lay hands on him. But this minister was the cause of the problem because he told God, create a problem that only you, you know, has a solution to. So God can create problems for which he alone has solution. He alone has solution. And that is what we are going to see, you know, in the little part that we're going to study now concerning David himself. When God creates a problem, obviously he has a solution. When God wants to raise a man, he allows a problem to come up. We see the case, you know, even of Joseph himself, when it was time to get him to fulfill his destiny, there was a dream 
that I believe God gave to Pharaoh. And God also ensured that he didn't understand the meaning and that the Egyptians, the Egyptians, uh, magicians and astrologers, they didn't have a solution. And that that solution, God had deposited only in Joseph. And so Joseph came out, he solved that problem by interpreting the dream, and then he became the prime minister. You see the same also happening even to Daniel. When Nebuchadnezzar had that dream, you know, of that great image, only Daniel, you know, could interpret, and then Daniel was exalted. And you see several of that in scripture. So God can create a problem, especially when he wants to elevate someone to a particular position for the sake of his kingdom, not for that individual sake, but for the sake of that kingdom and God will also ensure that he alone has solution to that problem. And so that is what we see also, you know, in the case of David. Now, what happened? As soon as the spirit of God, the anointed, the oil of God came upon David, the spirit of God came upon David, but on the other side, an evil, the spirit of God left Saul and an evil spirit, you know, attacked him upon him, attacked him which usually will get him into rage. And so you can see his face, they're looking so angry, looking so downcast, so depraved. Just, just take a look at him, you know, very angry. So Saul became angry because the spirit of God had left him. And that is what happens to people who don't have the spirit of God or anybody who's, who, who's, who, whose life, you know, God's spirit has departed from. There, there is the absence of joy. The Bible says the kingdom of God is not a meat and drink, but in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, where you have God's spirit tabernacling in you and allow him to do what he is supposed to do. You with people will see joy radiating even your life and around you. But in the case of Saul, you know, an evil spirit, the Bible says, came from the Lord and attacked him. And this got him, you know, into rage. As I said, you know, at the introductory part, there is no vacuum in the spiritual realm. You either have God's spirit in you, or you have the spirit of the devil in you. Amen. Uh, I, think, I think I should speak a little bit on this, you know, before I get a taken off point. Now, when you talk about man is made, you know, man is made of spirit, soul, and body. Now, God's spirit does not live in your soul. God's spirit lives in your spirit. And that is confirmed, you know, by several places, uh, several scriptures. Especially, you know, uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, that says the spirit of man is a candle of the Lord, searching the inward part of the human belly. God's spirit lives in your spirit. Because God's spirit lives in your spirit, satanic spirit cannot live in that spirit. And that is why we say that a born-again Christian cannot be possessed. To be possessed means that Satan dominates that person's spirit. It's not possible with a Christian. God's spirit is, is lives in your spirit, but in the realm of the soul and even the body, satanic spirits can be operating there. Where they have control of the person's emotion, total control, we'll be talking about obsession. And then there is also the other part, which is oppression. A Christian can be obsessed, you know, by things, even, if, if, even by the spouse, by the children and so on, but it's not possessed. A Christian can also be oppressed. So when we say that God's spirit, you know, is out of someone in the case of Saul, God's spirit was totally out. And so there was the need for another spirit to come to occupy his life. And that was the evil spirit. And that spirit will normally get him into rage. And once he's into rage, he gets very angry. No matter how close you are to him, no matter the extent to which he loves you, he doesn't care. He will cast a javelin at you once that evil spirit, you know, comes upon him. Praise God. And so, as a result of the evil spirit, you know, that came upon Saul, there is now a need. Saul needs someone to refresh him whenever the evil spirit was tormenting him. Here is now a need in the palace. And not just for any person, not just for an ordinary person, for a king for that matter. Because once the king is attacked, then it's like the whole community, the whole society is attacked. The Bible says, strike the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. So one son is struck as a king, that affects the entire, the, that affects the entire community. And, and so there was a, it, it, this was a source of concern. This was a tangible need. How do we address the issue of this evil spirit that torments even this king? And the servants of Saul recommended engage, engaging a minstrel to minister in songs to restore him. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, which I've projected there. It says, and Saul's servant said unto him, behold now, an evil spirit from God troubled thee. 
let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning prayer on a harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be relieved. Amen. You know, you, you, want, you, you, you wonder how these servants of Saul got to know the connection between ministry in songs, you know, and casting out devils. Of course, I want to put it, they've had experiences, you know, of things like that, probably with evil spirits, you know, even, even people from demonic or doing what, but whatever it is, they, they, they knew of this, that look, the solution to source problem is not, is not going to look for a psychologist, neither is it going to look for, 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 for a sociologist or for a medical expert. The solution to this is spiritual and it lies in simply, you know, ministering in songs because as he ministers in song an atmosphere will be created that will not be conducive you know for those demons to operate in and so this is the challenge this is the problem that needed you know a solution and so the servant said let's go look for somebody who would be a solution to this particular problem and this person that we are going to look for is not going to be a mediocre because we are bringing this person before the king and we are not going to go tell the king later oh we are sorry uh, this person is not able to it's not able to cast the demon out of you nothing like that before kings in those days because they were so they were so powerful and so there is a need and they were recommending that there must be a solution. And the solution is to be in somebody who can minister in songs. Amen. Praise God. Now, when this recommendation was made, you will see the first thing there, it says, this person must be someone who is a cunning player on the harp. And so there is an instrument that is mentioned. And this instrument is specific. It's not every instrument. And so it's not a combination of a guitar or a saxophone or a trumpet or a drum. No, no, no. It's like that instrument that we need is a harp. And then secondly, we don't just need anybody. We need someone who is cunning in playing the harp. And the meaning of the word cunning means skillful. A skillful player of the harp was sought and not just an anointed person. In fact, they didn't even mention anything about an anointed person. No, they said, we need somebody who is a cunning player of harp, somebody who is cunning, who is skillful, you know, on the harp. That is the person, you know, that we need. For today, if, if we see such kind of challenge today, the first thing we're going to look for is probably somebody who is anointed in court, but that wasn't the case here. They needed someone who can handle the harp, who is not going to play too loud, who is also not going to play too low, you know, who is going to be able to blend it such that the spirits inside of Saul, will not, they will feel so uncomfortable that they will relieve him for a season. It's not going to be a permanent solution, but whenever they come, this man will be called upon, you know, to minister in songs and then get rid of those spirits at least temporarily for a season or for a while. God needs skillful men today. Now, as I said in the last slide, skillfulness does not come by anointing. And that is why they didn't look for someone who is anointed. No, they needed someone who is skillful. And skillfulness come by training and then deploying the gift or the talent. Every one of us has a gift or a talent. There is something that God has deposited in us. There are those that are able to know such gifts or talent early in life and are able to channel their resources, everything about them towards developing that. But for the majority of people, we gamble. And ultimately, God helps us to stumble into knowing those gifts and talents, you know, and then we develop them and work even with them. And so skillfulness comes by training and then deploying the talent. If you're trained and you don't deploy the talent or gift, you're also not going to be skillful. 
All you would have known is know how people do the thing, but you won't know how to do it because there is a place for deploying the gift. If, for instance, God gives you the gift of the word of knowledge, that gift of word of knowledge does not become perfect in its operation in you simply because you have the gift. It is when you deploy it on a regular basis that you're able to understand the operations of that gift and able to take, you know, take advantage of it in, in fulfilling your destiny and advancing the purpose of the kingdom of God. And so what the anointing does is to deposit God's gift or talent in you. But that anointing is not going to make you skillful. You must train and develop yourself to be skillful by investing in the development of God's gift in your life. You, can wait, you can't wait for anyone to do that for you. It has to do with you as a person. In those days, when we were just, when we were just born again, they, they used to tell us that the majority, in fact, they tell us that 95% of the ministers of the gospel in America then, they taught us this, 95% of them are Bible school trained. And the opposite is the case in Nigeria at that time. Only 5% are Bible school trained. Once, once they perceive that they have the anointing, they go into the work of the ministry, you know, immediately. No, that is not how it's supposed to be. Even Jesus himself, the Bible says he called his disciples to be with him. It was later he was going to send them. He didn't send them immediately. He, he, he called them to be with him so that he would train them. He will impact their lives. Having been impacted for three years, he would then send them forth. So there is there is a period for calling during which you stay with the Lord, being trained, and then there is a period for sending forth. In fact, a different level of anointing goes with the sending forth. So you got to invest in whatever God has called you to be. You must not be satisfied with being a mediocre in what you do. Are you called to be a preacher? Are you called to be a teacher? Are you called to make resources even for the body of Christ? Are you called to be an intercessor? Whatever it is you'll be called to do, because we all have different roles in the body of Christ, you've got to develop yourself. You're not proficient in that thing immediately until you develop yourself. Get exposed to how that thing is done, you know, in different parts of the world so that you develop your gift. When your gift is not developed, the Bible says it will make room for you and bring you before great men. Do you want to come before great men? Then you got to identify your gift and you have to develop it. When you have identified, you have developed it and you deploy it, then it will bring you before great men. Praise God. And so the question to you is, are you anointed? Praise God if you are. Are you skillful? Thank God if you are. But are you anointed and skillful? which is the one that God desires of us, that you are both anointed and skillful. It's not sufficient to be anointed, neither is it sufficient for you to be skillful. We need a combination of the two to be able to accomplish God's purpose for our uh, lives, whether in the physical world or even in the spiritual. It doesn't matter what, where you are or what you are doing. God needs you to have both. Amen. Praise God. Now, praise God. Now, the person that the person that David is going to stand before is a madman. And when you say somebody, when you say somebody is a madman, it means simply that that person does not behave like a normal person. And someone who is a madman and doesn't behave like a normal person can be violent at any point in time because you don't understand what is going on in that person's mind. And so the person that is required to handle the issue of Saul, the madness of Saul, the insanity and the anger of Saul, it's not just gonna be somebody who's gonna get there and they will begin to give an excuse, oh, this is why I couldn't do this and this and that. No, 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 no. So to deal with Saul, you got to be somebody who is genuinely skillful, not skillful by paper, no, skillful by action. Because there is no room for flippancy or inexperience. Amen. Praise God. And so Saul must be refreshed as David played the harp. If Saul is not refreshed, what is going to happen is that the king will order his execution and that particular servant that recommended. It is not today that we just recommend 
any kind of person to occupy positions in society and even in the church and at the end will be disappointing and no action is taken against that. No, but this is not the case with the king. If you anyone you are recommending, you got to be sure that that person is going to perform, that person is going to deliver, you know, to the letter. And so this was an important, you know, important assignment that was that this servant was, was going to place on David in recommending him even unto Saul. Praise God. Even Nebuchadnezzar, you know, when the children of Israel were taken into captivity for the 70 years, in Daniel chapter 1, Nebuchadnezzar requested that a crop of Jews set aside unto, unto him. Look at verse 4, Daniel chapter 1, verse 4. It says, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science. Skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science. You're talking about a minimum of 3,000 years ago that this demand was made. This is much more relevant today. The kind of people that will, the kind of Christians that we need in the world today, they are not only Christians that have no blemish, they must also be Christians that are skillful in wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understand the science. They are Christians that are trained for what they do. They know what they do in out. They are like they are like perfect in the work. They are like they are like David that can cast a stone, go to the forehead of Goliath and bring it down immediately. Amen. Praise God. Please, can you help me to mute that person? Hallelujah. All right, let's look at uh, a servant recommends David. Now, earlier we established, we established, you know, that a request was there was a request, you know, or, or a recommendation proposed by the servants of Saul. There was a proposal that they should get someone who is skillful and cunning in plain of heart. They should go search. But it was one of the servants that said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite that is cunning in plain and a mighty, valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Now, this point is very important. This point is very important because important. It, it, it wasn't, you know, all of the servants that received recommendation. It was one of the servants. He said, I have seen a son of Jesse. I have identified, I know of someone who is cunning, you know, in the use of the harp. I know someone who is cunning in the use of the harp. That means that he has seen David play the harp and knew what David could do. Now, for him to have done that, it means that he must have seen David play the harp publicly. Because if David had been playing the harp secretly, there is no way this servant would have seen him. And if this servant had not seen him, he would have not been knowledgeable of the gift or the talent that David had in terms of the playing of the harp. And once it is not known, you know, that David can play the harp that is skillful in it, that servant would not have had the confidence, you know, of recommending him. In fact, would not even have dared to recommend him. Amen. And so it's important that whatever gift God has talented you with, don't hide it. The Bible says that no man puts, a, no one lighted a lamp and they puts it under a bush. No, you put it on top of the table so that no one can see with it. You don't hide your talent. 
You don't hide your gifts. You bring your gifts out so that men can see. You know, men can see and also can know what you have. Amen. Praise God. And so it's very Amen. important that you don't keep your gift, use your gift, deploy them, you know, in, a, in an environment that men can see and know what you have. And when it is time to recommend you, men will be able to say, I know of so, 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 and so person who has such a gift and recommend him. And so it was a servant. Can you imagine that? Think about that. It wasn't one of the princes of Israel that recommended David. And that is why we must not look down on people. No matter the lofty position that God has taken you to in life, you don't know who is going to recommend you to a greater position. Because whatever position you are occupying now, there is a position that is greater than that. And it takes men to recommend individuals to others. And so it was a servant that recommended David. It wasn't one of the princes. You can imagine if David had had encounter with his servant before and probably had looked down on this servant, had despised him, and you wonder if the servant would have recommended David. And that is why anyone that you meet in life, whether highly placed or lowly placed, learn to respect them. Accord, you know, respect unto them. Treat them well because you don't know when you're going to have an encounter with them again and you will need them. And a such man recommend you and the God use them to bring you before the king. And so as soon as as soon as Paul was brought, you know, before this, but Paul, please mute your mic. As soon as as soon as David was brought into the king's presence, he didn't fail. Look at First Samuel chapter sixteen, verse twenty-three. He says, "And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul." that David took an harp and played with his hand. And so Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Saul, David didn't disappoint the servant that recommended him. David didn't disappoint the Jesse that released him, that gave him gifts to go stay in the palace with Saul to minister unto him. How would it have looked like if David got there, stood before the king and played the harp and the demons never left? It would have been embarrassing. It would have been disgraceful, not just to David himself, it would have been disgraceful, disappointing to the parents, to the relations, to even the servant that nominated or recommended him and to kill Saul himself. But we thank God, David was skillful. And because he was skillful and anointed, he was bold to stand before the king and to play the harp to minister unto him. And the demons left him. Glory to God. How skillful are you? What is it that God has talented you with? Are you developing it? Are you training yourself? Or you are satisfied with the level that you have attained? There is this something ahead of you. You got to develop yourself. You are not yet your best because at the peak of your best, then you'll be accomplishing, you know, what God has called you to do. But as long as you are not yet there, you are not yet at your best. There is still room for you to develop your gift. When David was playing this harp and develop himself, I'm sure he never knew that the day was going to come when he will come into the palace of this great king of Israel to minister unto him, to stand side by side with him. If you read further that scripture, you will notice that David wasn't only playing for Saul. He was, Saul also made him his armor bearer because he was also a mighty man of war. But we don't want to go into that. And so he was skillful. I challenge you to develop your skill, sorry, to develop your gift or your talent, whatever it is that God has placed in you as a person, develop it, grow it, and let it become mature. And in the fullness of time, it will bring you before great men. God bless you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, sir. God bless you, moderator. 
Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof.